So the title of this talk is Machine Learning Now, How Rhino Inside Plus Hops Brings AI to Revit. And for anybody who wants them, I'll be sharing these slides on my LinkedIn later today. The terms machine learning and AI are pretty buzzy, as Charlie mentioned, but in general, I try to use the term machine learning to apply to the techniques and AI to refer to a system or tool. A little bit about me. I think that architecture is not just about creating an object, but about creating a process. And I like to create tools as an extension of that, as a way of interrogating and engaging with the process of making. For context, I'm not a computer scientist, an ML expert, or a statistician. I just like making stuff and working with people who like to do the same. I've always been interested in technology, but ML and AI are newish for me. Uh, Leland and I met at the AEC Tech Hackathon in 2018, and then we worked together on an ML project at the 2019 Hackathon, and it was really interesting, except we couldn't get it to work at all. After that, we started meeting monthly to explore ML and AEC. We hacked together again in 2019, again on an ML-based project, this time with some success, but that project mostly focused on implementing someone else's pre-trained model, and we really wanted to be training our own. We managed to keep meeting up periodically through most of 2020, including through the lockdowns. Then in January of this year, we had kind of a radical idea and decided to split the cost of an online machine learning course and posted this to our LinkedIn's. And I just wanna take a quick moment to recognize the folks who showed up. We had about 50 people join that first session. And of those 50, these three hung on and showed up week after week to work through the theory and the math and eventually the code all together. I definitely would not be able to present this research today if not for their tenacity and curiosity. So thank you guys. I also owe a huge thanks to Ben Novachinsky, our BIM manager, who helped to move mountains to let me get to the data on the other side. And of course, to Gary Handel and all the staff at Handel Architects. So before I get into software, I wanna take a moment and talk about how I view machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I think this is important because as I described the topic of this talk to coworkers and friends, I kept hearing versions of this question pop up. And I think it's mostly because of all the hype around machine learning. I suppose it's possible that someday in the future, AI might be capable of designing a building, but I don't see that in the near future and it's certainly not what my research is about. If you're looking for a lens to view it through, I, I think of it like this. We've been told that AI is going to replace us as workers and AI is getting pretty decent at doing work, stuff like answering phones or driving cars and maybe even building a model. But our profession isn't just about work, it's about meaning. We don't just make things, we respond and we experiment and we create. And as I mentioned, I believe that designing tools is a way of engaging with that design process. So what if we viewed it this way? I borrowed this quote from an article by Go Wang, who is an associate professor at Stanford Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. The entire article is fantastic, but Go rightly points out that, there is a, that there's something worth preserving in a lot of the work that we do. Cooking is not just about sustenance any more than architecture is just about shelter, and design is not just about modeling. I think this is a foundational concept to keep in mind when discussing the kinds of AI tools we should try to develop. We wanna to seek to empower and not to replace. So the name for this design pattern is human in the loop. And this kind of AI paradigm is already all around us. AI systems in our daily lives help to grab information when we need it or take care of small tasks for us. For example, when we ask Google to adjust the thermostat. Basically, we declare design intent and the system handles execution. This pattern is also somewhat familiar in how we work already. Partners or senior designers might sketch out a rough design intent, which then gets flushed out by more junior design staff. If we can encode this paradigm into our tools, we can abstract away the unsatisfying and time intensive tasks and spend more time engaging with the interesting stuff, the questions and the decisions. And there are a number of other benefits offered by human in the loop systems. There's transparency. Instead of a monolithic black box model, the design process is broken into smaller steps in a way that a human can understand. Humans can intervene and shape the outcome, allowing them to experiment. There's human judgment, especially within the design profession, there's no single right answer. Design is about understanding trade-offs and it's rooted in human preference and agency. Ironically, the system also becomes more powerful. 
Although it's not really that strange because we're combining human intuition with machine speed and accuracy. And the human can always defer to the AI system if they feel that it has actually produced an optimal result. And finally, this, this type of system retains meaningfulness of work. Asking questions, exploring, finding answers, these are all meaningful. Copying and pasting elements around a digital model or searching through old files usually isn't. By incorporating human intelligence, judgment, and interaction into the loop, we shift pressure away from building perfect algorithms. And all of these points underlie our notions of experimentation and craft and creativity. They're fundamental to what the very concept of a tool is. So this way of, dri this way of viewing tools is what drives my R&D work at Handle Architects. I want our designers' lives to be easier and more fun and for them to feel empowered to explore their architectural designs. We're a firm of roughly 200 people across four offices and we do work throughout the world. We work in many sectors, but since the firm's founding in 1992, we've designed over 43,000 units of housing, primarily in dense urban contexts. And across all of this work, we pride ourselves on our exceptional unit plans. For every project, we do market research to create units which are uniquely well-suited to their future inhabitants. We pour our expertise into every layout, and we study dozens of alternatives and iterations to make them efficient and beautiful. So it's only natural that our R&D focuses on ways that we can do this even better. And I think one way to do so is to use old solutions to help find new ones. For example, if I draw this, my tools figure out that I might wanna see this. I owe credit to this concept in part to a white paper published by Oliver Green from the Digital Design Group of AHMM in London. In this paper, he describes an in-house tool they developed called Homeground. That tool uses SD level parameters such as entry door location, unit shape, unit area, and unit dimensions to semi-autonomously semi search through unit layouts from completed projects. The Homegrown tool uses an algorithmic approach, but it gave me a lot of food for thought and inspired me to try and build a similar system which uses machine learning. And so when I read about the TensorFlow team releasing TensorFlow Similarity, I was instantly intrigued. TensorFlow Similarity is a new open source framework for doing what's called similarity modeling, also known as contrastive learning. Especially after having read the white paper about Homegrown, I knew I wanted to explore whether we could use this framework to do something similar. So how does TensorFlow Similarity work? Well, during training, TensorFlow Similarity learns how to place images somewhere within an n-dimensional space. And for simplicity, let's imagine this three-dimensional space shown on screen. In machine learning terms, there's two classes here, a cat and a dog, and they're represented by the images on the left. TensorFlow Similarity determines the location of each image based on the relative presence or absence of three features in a three-dimensional space. It learns what features to use through trial and error and looks for features which result in similar images being close together and dissimilar images being further apart. Once the model has been fully trained, it can process a new image very quickly. It simply looks for the presence or absence of those features that identified during training and decides where in the space the image should be placed. This is useful because once that image has been placed, we can then look at which of the training images are spatially proximate to it also known as its nearest neighbors. We can either return those ordered from closest to furthest, or we can use the nearest neighbors to try and infer the class of the new image. For example, if the new image is surrounded by pugs, it's probably a pug. Now the challenge is, how do we connect this framework to Revit? Python has some Python, I'm sorry, Revit has some Python tools, but as, an API, as well as an API, but it's natively a .NET based environment. TensorFlow is very particular about what types of Python it wants to work with. I learned this the hard way. It wants Python 3.8.5 and compiled for a specific processor, or GPU. Without going too deep into it, suffice it to say that it's pretty difficult to simply embed TensorFlow into Revit. Actually, the entire reason my hackathon project in 2019 failed was because we couldn't get .NET Core to talk to .NET Framework and we couldn't get either one to talk to Python. So trust me, trying to run software that's written in one language inside of software written in another language is kind of a nightmare, but there's a better way. I call this the software chasm and we need to cross it in order to have these two tools communicate. And there are actually two problems to solve. 
The first problem is training the model shown in pink, which requires information to flow mostly in one direction from Revit to TensorFlow. The second problem is using the model, which requires hosting and querying the model and then receiving results and actually implementing them. The first problem is not too hard. We only need to export and process the data once, and it can be handled in a range of ways, and some of which require very little sophistication. Pictured here is the data sort of being chucked into that chasm and then hauled out on the other side. And as you'll see in a moment, we built some tools to try and make this a bit more automated and intelligent, but this is the gist of the export and training portion. The second problem is more difficult. We need to host the model so it's accessible and get Revit to ping that model appropriately. Then we need to receive the results, allow the user to review them and make a selection, and then visualize it all in Revit. And we want this all to happen near instantaneously so it doesn't break the normal modeling workflow. And this is where we can start to pull in some off-the-shelf tools to meet our needs. Rhino Inside acts as a buffer for Revit, allowing us to query the Revit model and work with its data quite flexibly. On the other side of the chasm, Flask is a Python-based web server, which is capable of loading our TensorFlow model, listening for HTTP requests, which are the kind of requests that websites use to communicate, and then responding with model predictions. And the final piece of the puzzle is Hops. Hops is a Grasshopper plugin which can make HTTP requests. This includes encoding geometry or other Rhino data types and waiting for a response. It's really easy to use, and the folks at McNeil have released detailed documentation for each piece. They even have a step-by-step -step video walkthrough explaining how to set up Flask. So let's see an example in practice. As you can see here, the unit within this project is pretty tightly nested with its neighbors. So extracting this isn't as simple as just cutting out a chunk of the model. This is the script we developed to handle ex extraction of the units. It basically has seven steps, and we'll walk through each one. We have an area scheme in the model which corresponds with the unit areas. And the first step is to retrieve all of the unit, I'm sorry, all of the Revit area objects within that area scheme. We then compare all of these unit area objects and eliminate any duplicates. And we might have many duplicates due to the way that floor plans repeat as you go up the building. Once we've narrowed down the set to just one of each unique unit type, we then proceed to cycle through them, processing them one at a time. When processing each unit, we start by grabbing everything that's proximate. As you can see here, that might include multi-story objects. It's a little messy, but using that imprecise method initially makes the script move much quicker. It's much computationally lighter. The next step is to use a more fine-grained method and a more fine-grained volume to trim down any large geometry so we have a good representation of the stuff which is actually relevant to that unit. After that, we move the geometry into what I call a frame, and these frame objects hold on to the unit's metadata, making it easy to look up the unit later. And so here we see the finished result, one extracted unit. And we repeat this over and over, one at a time, until we've pulled out all the units from the project. Here you see approximately 100 pulled out of a single project. And baking the geometry was a specific workflow decision, which is meant to support that human in the loop concept. Baking everything allows the human to take a quick look at the geometry and confirm the extraction worked properly, as well as to make further edits to address any weird edge cases. Here, you can see that we've accidentally extracted the mail room. The human's common sense identifies this easily and deletes it, so it doesn't make its way into the data set and end up confusing the ML model. So we've exported all of our units into Rhino and the human is satisfied with the quality and consistency of the data. The next step is to transform the 3D models into 2D images for use in the machine learning model. We start by re-referencing all of the geometry into Rhino. Then we wrap it in bounding boxes and create abstract representations of the features. In this case, the gray is the space which is interior to the unit. The blue represents exterior, exterior wall area and the pink represents the unit's entry door. Because unit plans are equally valid when rotated or mirrored, we want to augment our data so that the machine learning model can learn this. The Grasshopper script handles the augmentation, turning one layout into a total of eight images. And this sort of makes sense because we want the model to be able to find a fitting layout regardless of the orientation. And this also helps build out our data set, which is a big plus. Each image gets a unique identifier, which combines both its unit GUID and a character string 
that explains what augmentation took place. For simplicity, we make that identifier the image name. And so every unit gets augmented and saved out. We then pull that data into a Jupyter notebook and run analysis and machine learning techniques on it. Shown here is Google Colab. Colab is basically Google's interpretation of a Jupyter notebook. It's hosted in the cloud for free, runs through the browser, interfaces with Google Drive, and uses remote servers to handle the actual computation work. The GIF is massively sped up, but you get the idea. And then once that model's trained, we save it out, and then we embed it in our Flask app, running here on my computer's local host through Visual Studio Code. We can then query it, and you can see the server respond as we do. And then we can use this GUID, the GUID info returned by the server to look up that unit back out of our catalog. And here's that preview. Rhino Inside handles this natively, overlaying preview geometry information into the Revit window. So TensorFlow Similarity was uh, released on September 13th of this year, which means that this project is very new. And there's still a lot of development to do on it before it's production ready. I'd like to incorporate other building elements into the training images, things like structural columns or mechanical chases, so the model will learn to match based on those as well. The architects in the crowd may be wondering about code compliance. Item number two is adapting the model's architecture to also incorporate categorical information like building code type, code year, geographical market, market segment, etc. It'd be helpful to have the model consider these factors as well when determining similarity. Ideally, the export process would export not to static Rhino geometry, but uh, would also export the parametric information needed to recreate the unit as native Revit elements. Then we could move beyond underlays into actual one-click unit creation. And the remainder of these items are more typical improvements, continuing to build up the data set by integrating data export procedures into project decommissioning, experimenting with architectures and larger data sets, and polishing pieces of the workflow that are pretty hacky. Um, we still need to work out a couple bugs and make it a little bit more robust. So I'm never quite sure how to end these. And so I thought I would let a state-of-the-art AI give it a try. And I know I didn't really give it much to go off of, but it didn't really do a good job. Uh, however, you can see that it did help me figure out what I wanted to say. And it even checked my spelling. Thanks. Thanks.